Hello and welcome to another episode of India Risk Report. And in this episode, we are looking at pre-lending checks and its future in India. The RBI has mandated a Know Your Customer set of guidelines for financial institutions and lending to be done according to that in all sectors. But there is still a fair amount of added interpretation on what the RBI guidelines are. In addition to that, the KYC guidelines are something which have been known to scare away customers as well as sometimes cause extensive delays in a customer wanting to progress with their business. Pre-lending checks as a concept has evolved over the years. While RBI's KYC norms have so long played the essential pivot based on which the checks have happened, the Reserve Bank itself has actually stepped in to clarify that it is not only the identity documents that need to be checked, but there needs to be a customer due diligence. By customer due diligence, it has left the ambit open for financial institutions to actually include various checks that they deem fit. Is your borrower politically connected? Can they use the political sources in order to garner support when they don't want to pay? What is the intent to pay versus what is the propensity to pay and the ability to pay? All these together today form the evolved concept of pre-lending checks. However, saying that, though evolution has happened, there are still a lot many steps that need to be taken. Primarily, the financial institutions need to be open to the idea of innovation and thinking out of the box and not having a checklist that will govern all and every account. That is where all financial institutions need to come together and say that it will be account dependent, it will be industry dependent and that yes, we are ready to try out newer concepts in order to take steps towards informed lending. We have two experts with us who are going to look at the dimensions concerning this whole subject. We have Mr. Sukhdeep Singh, who is Vice President of the BFSI area as far as IRIS is concerned. And he obviously engages with a lot of banks and financial institutions. And we also have with us Mr. Amar Mittal, a chartered accountant by profession with more than 40 years experience and also a partner with a leading CA firm, Sharma Goel and Co. My first question is to Mr. Sukhdeep Singh. Uh, how has the concept of pre-lending evolved over the years and what was a mandate of KYC? Has it been extensively broadened now? One typical example that comes in is that the, the Apex Court has now ruled that Aadhaar need not be the document that you must insist on. And earlier on, the PAN and PAN number seemed to be a working enough proof for banks to be comfortable with somebody when they were giving somebody an account or engaging with somebody. So what is it really? I mean, can you give in brief what is the minimum requirement and why should it be expanded to a much larger platform? Because many people don't have all the documents that banks ask for. The pre-lending checks have evolved with time. Uh, earlier, it used to be only uh, KYC related to uh, document verification. Then it came to, uh, it was uh, now uh, shifted to the credit checks. Ultimately, now the banks and the uh, financial institutions are focusing on 360 degree um, uh, checks, which also includes uh, borrower uh, reputation mapping, their uh, business health mapping. And uh, uh, the primary reason behind this is to check the intent uh, of the uh, borrower beyond the uh, fa fact factual uh, documents which are submitted. Uh, one of the uh, key things which has to be noticed over here is that uh, the solution which is ultimately the aim of the uh, organization is uh, changing from borrower to borrower depending on the industry, depending on the type of loan. Uh, so uh, the KYC also checks are made either made very stringent if, if the uh, exposure is higher and uh, uh, KYC checks also takes a longer duration for bigger exposure. And, and uh, uh, beyond the letter, uh, KYC has moved, uh, RBI also has mandated and KYC has moved beyond the letter and uh, uh, the, it, it basically is uh, more solution driven and, and uh, it's tailor made as per the client. Okay, Mr. Mittal sir, uh, 
the general feeling is, and some market surveys have shown, that these due diligence checks are beginning to scare away customers. And in many cases, these checks are being done to such an extent that on an average about 24 days are taken to complete the customer onboarding process. And even then when the customer submits all those documents, there is a insider's gossip that the banks are so pressed for time, so short of manpower, that they don't check all the documents, they just collect it and they feel that that is it. There's no double checking that happens beyond collection of that. Now, is that all true? Not exactly. As a bank auditor, what I have seen that it was being more done as a formality and that is why we are here today with lot of defaults. Even if a fewer checks are there but are carried out mm. like a residential address, mm. like the employer verification mm. or the uh, uh, person's activity mm. and whether the declared income mm. is as per the industry or norm or not. Mm. So if these basic intelligent steps are taken, mm. I think the paperwork can be reduced and still it can be meaningful. Okay. So Mr. Sukhdeep, uh, employees across banks are found wanting in implementation of AML and KYC guidelines. Why is that? Uh, uh, even though Reserve Bank has clearly stipulated certain guidelines, uh, we have come across numerous instances in which uh, the, uh, the uh, particular uh, uh, guidelines were not implemented on ground. Mm. There have been uh, various cases in which uh, it was compromised, uh, which has also led to Reserve Bank imposing penalties on various banks due to uh, non of, uh, not following the KYC norms. Mm. Uh, uh, I agree with Mr. Mittal. I'll just uh, like to uh, further substantiate that uh, uh, when we uh, talk about uh, 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 going beyond the paper formalities, the on-ground uh, verifications uh, have uh, taken a next step, which also includes the reputational mapping, mm -hmm. which also includes the business health mapping. Mm -hmm. It means uh, the capability and capacity planning is also checked. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various instances we have seen in, in which shell companies are there. Now, in one small room, there are hundreds of companies registered. They might be having very good website. They might be having very good, even on MCA, they might be having showing their all AGMs. But, uh, and they must be submitting all the documents mm. to the banker. Mm. Now, if banker merely sees uh, uh, the, the documents and uh, doesn't go on ground, let's, let's assume there's a warehouse and which shows the cap capacity of 1,000 tons. Mm. But on-ground wetting states, states that uh, there's a capacity of only 500 tons. Mm. So at Iris, we, of course, uh, undertake such assignments of doing on-ground capability, capacity, uh, and also on-ground uh, uh, reputation mapping, business health mapping. Mm. So uh, now uh, uh, the bankers in, uh, who are non the bankers who are non-compliant uh, are immediately, it's a zero tolerance for the banks and there's a penalty imposed by Reserve Bank of India. Mm. Uh, one of the foremost thing which we have to also consider in this is, it is continuous evolving. So whenever there's a fraud which has come to the light, uh, immediately there's a fraud reporting which is mandatory to Reserve Bank of India. Uh, the advisory is sent by Reserve Bank of India to all the bankers so that it's mitigated and immediately the circular is amended or uh, it, it is a new circular uh, is uh, uh, circulated so that uh, these kind of instances do not reoccur. Okay, we are, while we are at the subject of banks, Mr. Mittal, uh, banks still need to meet you to physically complete the KYC uh, through countersigned documents Now, is and biometric requirements also that are coming in today. Now, is that mandated or is everybody now adding to their requirement of checks and checks to a stage where it will be impossible for any person without having all the mandated ID documents to even open a bank account? See, opening of a bank account does not require that kind of a verification or KYC. It is primarily when the lending starts and the borrowing starts, then that is very important that the person's profile needs to be thoroughly investigated. Okay, so but, but once that is thoroughly investigated and if the if person, I mean there's something called also your, your credit rating, 
is something called also that you have a price track record of having borrowed and delivered. Is that taken into account? Of course, everything. But everybody doesn't uh, require to be having a credit rating. Credit rating starts with the companies and uh, larger companies and other where the requirement is. Mm. But for the smaller companies, it is basically their conduct and uh, their overall position in the industry. Now we have got industrial, we have FIKI, we have PhD, we have SOHM, CI. We have a lot of information on the industry sectors and other is generated. Mm. So whatever figures are being provided by the borrower, that lender need to look into. Okay, so some very important aspects have been touched by both of you, but we'll have to come back after break to look at some of the other issues. For instance, there are examples across the world where big financial institutions, some of the biggest companies, are spending up to a hundred million dollars upwards just to get KYCs done of who they engage with and what their employees done. And also there is the requirement that we need to have a standardized approach that a person as a citizen or as a small company knows that unless I have these documents, I can't really make my breakthrough. But more on that after break. Welcome back. We are looking in this episode of India Risk Report on the pre-lending checks and the future of it in India, both in the extent to which the banks carry these out and also the non-banking financial institutions. So, Mr. Sukhbeet, uh, there are a number of non-banking financial yes. institutions. They do lend out a fair amount of money. One of the areas I understand where they do lend out a lot of money is in the real estate sector. And again, in the real estate sector is where they tend to try and retrieve their money back when a crisis begins to loom. Uh, so can you first explain to us that how the non-banking financial institutions work, some big examples of some of them in the market, and how are their rules of engagement with customers different from that of banks? So um, NBFCs and banks coexist. NBFCs over the years mm. uh, have made their significant presence um, across all the corners of India. Uh, we are having around active 300 NBFCs, whereas uh, and, uh, and uh, some of the lending which they do uh, they have a, a unique selling proposition in that, like in uh, tractor loan, con consumer durables, mm. two wheelers, mm. and and uh, uh, of course the real estate. Mm. Uh, the only difference, primarily, I mean the one of the foremost difference which we have recently also seen, there have been certain NBFC uh, uh, crisis uh, for some of the uh, some of the players, some of the organizations, mm. was that liquidity. Uh, 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 like uh, banks can fall upon Reserve Bank of India in case of any such. But for NBFCs presently, uh, they are totally dependent on the uh, the cash, uh, the, the the reserves basically. Uh, so it, 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 they sell through the various uh, through an NCDs, non-convertible debentures, mm. uh, or or they are dependent on the EMIs, which uh, which is paid back by the clients. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, foremost thing which NBFC, uh, uh, when we talk about NBFC's uh, presence in India is that not only they are having a, uh, a lot of innovation in their products, they also, uh, uh, their, their, uh, uh, their KYC compliance is to be, has, has been seen as much better even in, than in comparison with certain public sector banks. Oh. Yes, right. uh, uh, they, their credit and risk uh, has been um, uh, amazing. Uh, even in the recent cases of NBFCs, uh, more than the uh, the problem has been only the liability side. In asset uh, asset side, they are still strong. They carry very good strong book. For example, uh, if I talk about the uh, uh, the financial aspect of the financial credit aspect of this, uh, so 61 percent of the uh, uh, exposure of two wheeler is. Uh, uh, loan is undertaken by the uh, NBFCs, and uh, tractor loan mostly 
or most of these public sector banks like to take over this portfolio because it comes uh, it's uh, covered under priority sector lending okay okay so obviously it's a strong and stable sector in its own right and as you brought out in some areas they seem to be doing better than banks uh, mr mittal sir firstly do you agree with all that sukhdeep has said and if you don't then what are your initial thoughts on the same subject equally linked with that is there seems to have been a sharp 5% increase in the non performing assets in the case of uh, nbfcs and likewise the nbfcs have tended to target and go straight for the real estate sector where 50% or more of the real estate sector is dependent on them now so therefore what has happened is that a there is a factor that the nbfcs itself despite their stringent norms are under pressure but then they go to the real estate sector which then has a ripple effect down to a simple honest investor who's looking for a roof on his head because he is invested in the real estate sector somebody else has borrowed from the nbfcs and between them there is a mismatch and the citizen suffers or have i got the whole matrix wrong no no you see it doesn't work really that manner nbfcs are doing a good job because their procedural requirements are less than the bank and two wheeler four wheeler and uh, consumer goods mm. fridge tv they go to that extent mm. whereas getting these small loans from bank may be a little uh, tedious job mm -hmm. now coming to the these are all short term funding and 12 installment 36 installments like that what happens is that because of the liquidity crunch in the market uh, therefore uh, and uh, let us talk about the housing sector mm -hmm. a person books a flat mm -hmm. and he has to pay the installments mm -hmm. uh, to the builder mm -hmm. and he takes a loan from the nbfc and nbfc and builder are doing now he is to service that loan and when and we uh, the housing sector the real estate sector is going down he becomes at time a little jittery whether the investment is worth it or not mm -hmm. so some teaming leading and uh, uh, starts in the installments now the the nbfcs are funding the all these projects through short term funding now if the short term recovery gets slow their commitments on the short term borrowing which they have done becomes in fault oh. and that is where the crisis starts okay okay so sukhdeep i mean you you obviously quite excited about the points he's made you uh, want to put in your i would like to just uh, again add on certain points uh, the asset liability um, uh, metrics basically asset li uh, liability uh, has to be, uh, management is there in the banks Uh, this was missing right now in nbfc recently reserve bank has taken note of it after certain uh, uh, problems in uh, with certain nbfcs and they are working on it uh, uh, this commercial papers basically is of short duration and and the lending is of as uh, sir also said well, mr mithil also said was for the long, long duration so sometimes uh, the heavy dependency on commercial papers uh, makes them uh, the the, uh, the they are not able to match the cycle of assets and uh, liability so uh, sometimes the maturity uh, uh, of the commercial paper is just a month away whereas the uh, the assets the loan which they have yet to be recovered in complete is uh, years away so this this these are uh, certain uh, aspects which has to be uh, considered Uh, while uh, 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 ensuring that okay. NBFCs so, plug so this loophole. So, so, Mr. Mittal, uh, you know, it is said that R RBI only provides the guidelines and leaves it up to institutions to frame their own policies. Now, so therefore, what are the RBI guidelines, and where are the institutions going over the top with their policies? Because there is one example, at least, of a study. that says that financial institutions spend up to 500 million dollars annually just on kycs and customer due diligence as per thomson reuters now and furthermore that that world's top financial institutions the top 10 are all spending in the range of 100 million dollars upwards in doing due diligence so obviously i'm those are global institutions but in india the guidelines are there by the rbi what are those guidelines and how are financial institutions in india 
adding to the discomfort level of the borrower or their own staff because there is a case that we have and it's been highlighted that in the case of HSBC which had vastly understaff compliance departments. So therefore they were not being able to do the compliance. They were asking us to comply if we had an account with HSBC but what was happening they were collecting the documents or papers and waiting for one fine day when they'll have less work to check on that. Is that true? Yes, that that was uh, not to be taken uh, was not being taken as a uh, priority, but primarily, as I said, that mo uh, an account opening is only a uh, beginning. The conduct of the account shows the credit or intent, as he said, uh, of the uh, person. Thereafter, the borrowing starts, and when the borrowing starts, the checks have to be stringent. Basically, RBI insists that there should be a complete 360 degree profiling of everybody who is coming to the bank or NBFC for a loan. And they only see the security. Suppose the NBFC is giving a loan against a house property and the builder has registered their uh, mortgage or lien, then they don't do uh, further checks. But that is not correct because the real estate value, if it goes down below a point, then the balance money has to be recovered. And VFC is committed to the builder. So, so what, is, what is the minimum that the RBI expects as R a compliant measure? They only want that the, uh, uh, on the NBFC front, I will ex uh, this is in two parts. On NBFC front, there has to be a proper match between short-term requirements and short-term receipts. Similarly, long-term requirement and long-term receipts. Often, short-term uh, uh, borrowings are used for long-term and that is where this liquidity crisis arises. Now, as far as the borrowers are concerned, borrower capacity, I think, is the main thing to be evaluated. And since different people for different things, for car, for, uh, with one NBFC, for house with another MGFC, they do overcommitment, and that is where the things go wrong. So it's the bottom line is that uh, people are always trying to overstretch themselves, mm -hmm. and the financial institutions, the bank's job is to ensure that, despite your ambitions, you have to be real about what you can pay back. Absolutely. And 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 unless that is accurately evaluated. All other flashing of documents is by and by because that really doesn't come into play. Because so, uh, can I add? Uh, to no, but we're running out of time. So uh, I think we, at least I have broadly understood now, that this whole thing goes a lot beyond the KYC requirements. In the instances of borrowing from non-banking financial institutions and even from banks, it is not that you just prove your credentials. But more importantly, you prove your ability to borrow and then pay back in the given time frame that you have committed to. If you are not able to do that, then obviously the money is not going to come your way. Thank you very much for your very wise inputs and uh, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.